Dylan Gott, welcome to the Patreon episode of The Rest Review. You know who you're, we're talking about? Ooh, we're, we're not talking, talking about a monster. Wait. We're talking about a nice man. Oh, no. The people are taking these requests to places that I hate. Why aren't we talking monsters? I like that we're talking uh, about uh, Kenta Kobayashi. I have to tell you, I didn't... Kobashi, not Kobayashi. It's not the guy who ate the hot dogs, although we could do a special episode. Oh, my God. Why don't we have... Why haven't we done a fucking episode on Kobayashi, the guy who eats all those hot dogs? The, the, of course, the most stepdad man in the world, Finn, Japanese man, came over and (laughs) ate a shitload of hot dogs. Oh, and then competed against that bear... Who beat him? Did the bear or Kobayashi win? The bear won. Because it was like, it was man. That was when they got, um, oh my God. I don't know. It was like 50 little people or an elephant who could haul an airplane. And uh, then they oh, were yeah, like, well, those little guys are really giving it a go. <laughs> this is in the weird time when Spike TV lost Monday Night Raw. And clearly the executive was like, listen, we still need to freak the people the fuck out. So Sadly, I know it was not Spike TV. It was Fox. Because that, that shit happened when I was 15, and I remember every goddamn minute of it. Because I think one of them was like, can you beat up a ben, kangaroo? And the kangaroo really fucked the other guy up or something. Yeah, and it, wasn't that one where Ben Johnson raced a horse? Yes, Ben Johnson raced a horse. Oh, let's all get ready to be the saddest boys in Zad Town. Oh, I love it. Why is it? At least crying? it's not wrestlers fighting a bear. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. But... The reason why we get off on these diatribes is because Kensuke Kobashi's career could be summed up thusly. He was good. Now it's over. Kenta Kobayashi is basically like if it all worked out, if worked out, I mean, giant Baba finds you and it's just like, you're the future. What? I just want to be. You're the future. Well, this is the interesting part is he's very much the rock to Misawa's Stone Cold War. Misawa's always on top. And then... Baba Kenta, dies. Yeah, and then yeah. Kenta kind of is the number. He's the what I always think of him is as he's the he's like every guy that faced Hulk Hogan. He's the he's the yeah. he's the opponent. They do a really good. It's like Masawa's one, he's two, and then I don't know enough about Japanese wrestling is three and four because there's going, four the Kawada the ranking, and can I just yeah. say this? Going through the research, here's what you see: they have a plan for every wrestler that they stick to from the beginning. We look at the, yeah. this guy, we measure his potential. We go, okay, if he can get it to his potential by this time, then he exceeds his potential. This is what he gets. Mm-hmm. It is so logical and lovely. Like, so basically he wants to be a wrestler. He keeps getting denied by the all, the, all Japan jo- dojo for training. He finally meets giant Baba. Giant Baba is like, this is a stocky man. I'll look good beating. Get him some trunks. Exactly. He comes in and they literally map it out of you're going to come in. And it's so good. You're going to come in. You're going to lose every match, but every match you're going to show subtle improvement. Now, this is pointed out in the research. And by the way, this is going to be our least fun episode ever because I just wrestle nerded out about this guy because I just understood why Japanese wrestling has come to the forefront is because it's the only wrestling that still makes sense. Yeah, and it also makes you pissed off because the reason why they can do these long storylines with Kobashi and wish with uh, Misawa is because they're like, okay, we have these guys under contract until the day I fucking die. And the thing that makes you upset is if they could do the exact same thing in WWE where it's like, yeah, we are the only people with money. If they wanted to, they could have been like, all right, Seth Rollins going to come in the shield. And if things go well, here's well he'll be in two, three years, two years time, three years time, three years, five years, and ten, right? And they clearly did that with Kobashi because, like you said, he loses sixty three matches in a row, and he finally gets his victory over some jobber, Mitch Snow. You know, they bring in they bring in a guy from the NWA to job out to him. He always talked about how Mike Tyson was his inspiration to get into the ring. And it's a very interesting thing of he is all of the good qualities of Mike Tyson, none of the bad. Fiery, explosive performer, incredibly interesting and intriguing to see in the ring. Uh, Does not and never has done the bad, bad thing or befriended Don King or done so much cocaine that he thought porno was just regular TV. Yeah, he never bought a tiger and then just made it attack Robin Givens. It's It's the porno that he thought was regular TV is one of those things where you're like, that's not the worst thing Mike Tyson did, but that's the thing where you're like, oh, that's the level Mike Tyson was at. 
We all live in fear. Well, when you're a mafia enforcer by the time you're 12, Mike Tyson, good lord. Uh, yeah. Kent Kobashi, though, um, is so funny, though, because you're right. All of his role models are could be seen as legitimately evil, but then he just like turns out and takes the best from any situation. Because in 1989, he also gets taken under the Road Warrior's wing and taught to work out the Road Warrior way, which means, hey, tell, while you're doing steroids, there's more if steroids. This was, if this was a gimmick, like if this was done for television... Or Road Warrior Hawk was just like, I got to kill a guy. And they were like, well, don't kill this guy, but hurt him. And he was like, okay. <laughs> and then Kenta was like, you don't under- Pain is my meditation. My name is Kenta. Like, he, he just seems like Kenta's such a... Career yeah. Is it's basically like, are you an ordinary white guy who hates everyone in Japan because you grew up in the 50s and just keep muttering weird slurs about Ike? Yep. Well, time to meet Kenta. He's your best friend. I will say this. If anyone has listened to the latest Dan Carlin entire series. I have not. I have not. I'm, I'm saving it for a big car ride. I have. Ooh, well, you will appreciate why everyone hated the Japanese so much from that era. Because let's just say this. They didn't fight fair. They no, just. They did not. Oh, no, no. It, not it, fight fair. But like, obviously, they were way outnumbered and they were signed up for a war that they could have never won in the first place. But. You really understand in any seven every any man who came of age in the seventies who like you're buying a Honda, you don't care about me and starts wailing. You understand yeah. why? Oh. But anyway, Imperial Japan was a real son of a bitch. Also, if you really mm. if you uh, you, what's very fun about Southeast Asia is all those countries, especially if you talk to the old people, fucking hate each other, and you're like, I wonder why. And you open one history book, and it's so insane. The book actually yeah. screams at you. Oh, <laughs> the- shit! I hold the screams of millions. But anyway, yeah. it's so funny. And I wish I was this type of person. We would be both way better off if we were like this man where it's like he meets the road warriors and they're doing blow and punching walls. And then he looks at them and goes, they seem to be in good shape. I should probably ask them how to work out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then he's like, sees here's... Mike Tyson and Mike Tyson's like on top of a mountain beating up, beating someone to death. And he's like, hmm, that man's quite determined to get to the top of that mountain. I yeah, yeah. probably should take the determination of that man and mix it with me. Kenta only sees the positive and how it relates back. It's crazy. Like, it's always <laughs> just sort of like, like Kenta could meet Ted Bundy and be like, that man knows how to talk. <laughs> <laughs> that guy really goes for what he wants in life and he doesn't Ted Bundy, care. Hell of a promo. <laughs> Well, that's the other thing about this guy. Osama bin like, Laden organized. I, I want to say that I was totally one of these guys in 2005 who was like, I love Kobashi and had seen one match. But I can totally see why American wrestling fans, if you're just getting in Japanese wrestling, cling to Kobashi over Misawa because Misawa looks like a grilled cheese you threw on the ground. And Kobashi is like what we're used to seeing physique wise out of a wrestler. Like he's also, a big I like, poofy but boy. I also- like about uh, Kobashi is that when he comes to America for those Ring of Honor matches, he doesn't know how to put his hands up. He was clearly told like, oh, in North America, you acknowledge the crowd. And so when he walks out for that Just first match up. against Samoa Joe, like it's basically like, uh, hello, my <laughs> name is wrestler. Like he's like, like it's so like he's sort of awkward and weird. But fuck me, can he fucking wrestle? Like, holy shit, fuck Yeah, shit, all fuck. you need to know about this guy is 23 five-star matches from Elzer, which, I mean, five stars is whatever As, from uh, from Count to Penny's Dave. Enough, but um, Christopher Hobson says so many good things in this. Uh, but basically this, Dave Meltzer, who I believe loves this man more than his children, states he had to keep an eye uh, on Kobashi while he was still trained, uh, being trained by older wrestlers. But he's talking about Giant Baba. Giant Baba apparently always saw um, this future for Kenta and basically roadmapped. He was trained by Dory Funk Jr., Giant Baba, um, Kazuhiro Sonata, and I don't know how to pronounce this last name, and I feel very bad about it. Matt's oh, that is Fuji. Bill Smith. Oh, you're right. It is George South. Um, <laughs> but he basically is this very amazing mix. So he gets very much a grounded Japanese style, but always kind of works with those nice North American flares. And also clearly throughout his career is seeking out North American wrestlers to pick up the little things that draw in the Japanese crowd, particularly his relationship with Stan Hansen, which if mm. you look at it in the ring is like, well, there's the time that Stan Hansen just broke his arm because Stan Hansen's a blind man. 
but they also have this long, beautiful, drawn out story of how Kenta l- learns the lariat and brings that to Japan and has a Japanese wrestler doing it. And you're like, this fucking guy, just he's just a nice boy. Mm. And he also like, well, the whole Hanson storyline is, I mean, if you're this deep into wrestling, you know, but he loses the Hanson tons of times gradually just like his other losing streak gradually getting closer and closer and there's a really great match where it's like kobashi has him i think it's 93 it's on it's on youtube if you just look up stan hansen kenta kobashi on youtube it's 30 minutes of kobashi murdering him and you're the crowd is totally like oh my god this is when it's going to happen and then hansen hits him with a lariat and then it's over and it really also makes you think like the lariat may be the best finishing move of all time because randy orton the RK away from anywhere, it's like if if you're a jobber, Hansen will like line it up and knock you over. But if you're top of the card, then all he just goes like <laughs> you're dead. And it's what such I a quick move. About you can do it till he's a hundred. The thing with the Larry too is he could do it right now. I guarantee he's yeah. doing it to someone in a fucking show knees right now. Larry. Ah, yeah, he's just like, I'll take down this tree. Ooh, now I get to fuck it. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing I remember about me. I never had my match with Hulk Hogan because he wouldn't beat me in the and then fucking fill this fucking bucket full of piss after drinking contest. So you drink <laughs> but it is harder to watch Japanese wrestling sometimes because it's like, oh, this big intimidating doctor Did you death. Say and Japanese then... wrestling? Hmm. Did I? <laughs> yeah. I hope Japanese I did. Japanese wrestling. It's hard to uh, it really watch hard Japanese to watch wrestling. Japanese wrestling. It's re- it's this is the type of I listen to rap instead of listening to the commentary. That's what I do. So you put on the match and then you just put on uh, "Up in Here" by DMX on repeat. Oh well, no, it's not good rap. I listen to Maestro Fresh West. Oh fuck! I don't even know who that is, and I hate him. He's the guy who's saying "Let your backbone slide," and I watched one of his concerts one time, and he said, "I'm a Canadian legend." And then one guy was like, "No, you're not," (laughs) and then everyone laughed. And he has one song about how kids wear their goddamn pants too low. Oh, good. I love. There was a real (laughs) great moment in society that, like, 2000s time. That post 9/11 era was big for two reasons: one, Mm -hmm. getting people to go uh, support the war in Iraq; two. Trousers are being worn too low, for God's sake. Yeah. You better salute those firemen. First thing they like is tight pants. But he really did start working out a lot, and then that gained him. And honestly, his entire career, Kobashi's, is his uh, guaranteed... I mean, maybe this this is probably giving Baba way too much credit, but this guy has to try it over and over again for all Japan. And he's like, well, this guy is resilient. His entire character will be that he's resilient, but it's weird that he's, Oh, he's the resilient underdog. Who's clearly bigger than all these dudes. It's resilient, but it's again, how they do it is again, having those like eras of having him do all of those matches with Stan Hansen, um, like who he's put up against and stuff like that is yeah. like it's underdogs in different ways. You know what I mean? Like they, the thing with Japanese wrestling I like is it's just like, stick to the plan exactly right. and but they pick good horses like in the Misawa one the, oh. we'll do I'm sure we'll do an episode on Misawa eventually and the way they push Misawa of like the greatest unmasking in history where it's just like I've had enough of this fucking mask my name is Mr. Hiro Misawa I'm going to beat you and then he does beat Jumbo Saruta and then having that be essentially his introduction versus Kobashi always being the underdog and like never really overtaking Masawa under Baba. No, and it's also very interesting because Masawa and also um, uh, Kobashi's entire sort of careers. It shows the genius of Giant Baba because he's sort of like they're like the little time bombs he creates. He dies, they go away, they go off, and then they also both. At I assume Masawa also fucked off from all Japan at a certain point. They all they both did. They fucked off and made Noah, and the only people left were like. Stan Hansen and Mike Rotunda, and then All Japan eventually, of course, was the greatest company in the world, and no one, no one showed up to the shows because they were like, "What else do I need other than Stan Hansen beating up IRS?" Exactly, yeah, and then oh, then it's like, yeah, that's because All Japan, and then Muda, uh, Muda comes, and then you have the Muda era, and now it's just a, a, a now it's essentially just a Halloween supply store. <laughs> yeah, now eventually, now essentially, it's just uh, so. They fight over who gets to have Vader's mask that made the smoke come out of it. Oh, 
I would fight so hard for that. Just I would fuck. My favorite part of that was is that he had to take it off for the smoke to come out of it. So he'd take it up, put it in the middle of the ring, and then it would go. That was sick. That should be someone's character now. Every time on Monday night, hey, this guy's got a mask that fucking. I guess Eric Rowan did have the weird briefcase with a with a light in it. Oh, I hated that so. <laughs> I don't think anyone did. They were like, "You got a briefcase with a light in it, and then what? Shut up!" But then what? Yeah. We're still paying you, loser. Yeah. Enough of this. Enough of this fucking shit right here. But there's interesting stuff. Like they take uh, deviations. Obviously, Misawa and Kobashi didn't just fucking fight each other for ten years. They take deviations to. Um, Misawa and Kobashi become a tag team, and you can tell who the favorite is because they come out to Misawa's theme song. I always hate that, though. <laughs> Blending the theme songs together sucks, but it's better than just being like, this guy's fucking better than that guy. I miss the days of how you knew they were the bad guys as the bad guys came out all together and the good guys came out individually. That's what I always enjoyed. That is like a subtle thing where the tag team, where they're not very good together yet, come out individually. Yeah. And also, like you, sh- it should be said this: if you haven't seen Kobashi match, he has like ninety-five different finishing moves. He takes the lariat from Stan Hansen. That's kind of like his. I love um, how he did that. I think that was such a good move. Yeah, beating part. the guy and then using his own move is like this move is so sick. I just have to use it. Also, he had a bunch of knee problems, so he his finisher was the moon salt, which is crazy because this guy's like bigger than John Cena, and his finisher is the moon salt. I know. And it's also and then he also explains, by the way, that he had to um, he had to uh, figure something else out because that's why he moved to the Lariat, because he was like, oh, boy, my knees. This is going to be trouble. Yeah. And if it's like a man in the all Japan system being like my knees kind of hurt, that means he has no kneecaps and he's currently yeah, yeah, yeah. bleeding. He, he, yeah, exactly. I was about to say he's currently bleeding. Like this is also the only time in the research we've done of a Japanese wrestler that a Japanese wrestler. um expressed concern for his own body (laughs) you should watch some of the 93 94 stuff where it's like i think my knees hurt but it's also like he does matches with dr death where it's like dr death does the backdrop driver which is just like and then i pick him up and then he lands on his head and then if his neck isn't broken well that's when i take the axe to the back of the neck and i guess my finisher would be cutting off a man's actual head I just hate him. That's what I you got to know about me. I hate his I live I hate his living breathing guts. <laughs> well, I've been to wrestling because they don't fight back when you kill them. So, John, I have a question to ask because this is kind of setting up what my opinion is on it already, but do you think that this style, like the King's Road style, the All Japan style is sort of downplayed about how dangerous it was? Yes, it is because basically what it is is it's the worst type of wrestling style because it's it it's it hurts you, but it looks mm. very very much like it it shouldn't. Yeah, and it's like like three of Kobashi's the taking moves on that, that yeah. Kobashi does give his opponent tuberculosis within ten years. Basically, <laughs> this style. like it's like yeah, it's like oh, well, it's an internal terrible. disease. Yes, exactly. That looked terrible, and what did it do? It bruised every single one of his internal organs. Yeah, it's the classic. Hit them as hard as you can, but in the chest. But then they're just like, "That's boring. Let's hit each other in the face because yeah, we it's are the, wrestlers, it's the and it's not of fake." Ricky Steamboat, like everyone always talks about, yeah. Ricky Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat always looks the stiffest, and he's not even touching you. And the sort of like post, like almost post, and then post Baba All Japan is like it looks like they're coughing in the middle of the ring, but they're actually stabbing each other in the gallbladder. You know what might be like. I'd be interested to watch an old Cactus Jack Ricky Steamboat match because those guys were both like very good at just pulling their punches. So it probably looks crazy and it was just very good. But like there's like in the Misawa Kobashi matches later in the 90s, like there's a tiger suplex just off the apron onto concrete. And then oh, it's yeah. like, this keep going. Basically, the entire wrestling strategy of Japan in the 90s and early 2000s is like, all right, Dynamite Kid was in a wheelchair by 40. Let's aim for 35. Let's like... You know, like, like. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how Dynamite Kid... You know what it is, probably. It's the it's the fact that he did steroids till his bones were dust, Dynamite Kid. Um, and Kobashi yeah, well, did Dynamite, steroids, but his bones remained. The thing with it is it also, when you watch... Yeah, it's like, what happened to the Dynamite Kid? Well, he had two discs that were literally didn't exist because of injury, and instead of going to the match or not going to the match. He went to the match and then just kept 
hurting himself more. <laughs> he, 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 hear me out here, gave himself paper cuts when he wasn't being hurt by the other wrestler because he wanted to nut a bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he believed in one thing and one thing only, and that was death before dishonor. <laughs> exactly. But, of course, what, what were we on about? Um, no, because I was just, my main point was that was everyone's like, man, the chair shots that had really obviously the Benoit or the Man- Nancy Benoit tragedy and Daniel Benoit tragedy. Uh, it led to Eddie Guerrero and no one's ever like, yeah, they took a bunch of German suplexes off a ramp and then Mitsuharo Masawa literally died in the ring. And then instead of, they just put a sheet over him and went, he would have wanted this and just pinned him. Yeah, of course. Yeah. They, they had a priest come out and pin him and he was like, he was pinned by God. <laughs> He's, he only sells for God. He yeah, sells it was for the God. Austin. It was the Austin Brett finish. He didn't he tap. For God. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tap. That's so fucking cool. God just put him to sleep. But it's true though. Misawa took one backdrop and was like, just died. And no one ever talks about like how crazy the style is. They're still like, no, I'll guilt free watch a match where this guy. But the crazy thing is, I guess it's kind of like the Mick Foley thing. It, Kobashi's the one by and large taking all these crazy bumps like again, on not not tables concrete yeah yeah but again it's weird Mick Foley is not as far away from Nick Gage as anyone wants to acknowledge but like everyone's like Mick Foley nicest guy in the business Nick Gage that guy's a fucking crazy son of a bitch and it's like Nick Gage is just Mick Foley plus he has a knife like the only difference between Nick Gage and Mick Foley is Nick Gage has a knife no I think the difference is parental love Oh, yes, that is the other difference. Yeah, Nick, Mick Foley doesn't uh, recoil uh, at a hug like some people recoil from a hot stove. <laughs> um, after his tag, this is some pretty good stuff. So he has a tag, successful tag team with Masawa, does Kenta Kobashi, and then we get to one, the, the only thing we're going to talk about for the rest of this podcast, which is his team with the Patriot and Johnny Ace. Absolutely. Global, energetic, and tough. Yeah. Get. And... um. Johnny Ace was all three, and then the other two just kind of sat out of the ring and go, good job, Johnny Ace. That's all that happened. I fucking love WCW, or pardon me, uh, Japanese tag teams, because it's always like, do you remember this guy from when you liked wrestling? And you're like, wait a minute. That guy's brother's in Japan. Yeah, and he's our equivalent of Adolf Hitler, but he's in the ring. Like, it's so funny where you're like, (laughs) Why is Johnny Ace still in charge of town? It's like, because he had a massive and long career just somewhere that where you don't know about. Well, and he's in some five-star matches, Johnny Ace is. Just because it's I like mean, the, Mrs. Bob. No, legit. Like, he's in five-star matches. Him and Dr. Death have a five-star match with Misawa and Kobashi because, of course, they do. Um, but it's all because, as you've said on this show, Mrs. Baba like Johnny Ace. Mrs. Baba went... Johnny Ace, more like Johnny Splash. Oof, oof. She loved that long mullet. Oh my the god. The idea of an elderly did. woman just being like seeing a mullet and being like giant bubba. Well now I have giant poom poom. <laughs> 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 That's how it works. When they turn when you get them turned on, they it gets bigger. That's right. It's the same. <laughs> I know about anatomy. Nothing that you nothing you've said so far, I can I disagree with or will I disagree with? Hmm. I have a bunch of volunteer work to do. Sorry, that's I volunteer teach sex ed. And by teach, I mean I have six and a half hour long audio files. I just keep on sending the YMCA email title. Use these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, my name. I'm a member of the Baba family, and I have some advice for this financial firm. What are you talking <laughs> about? Oh, is this? Do not all companies work where if your dad owns it, then every member of his family just gets to pick a favorite and have advice? <laughs> He won the Triple Crown, the All Japan Triple Crown, three times in the 90s. And he had two crazy five-star matches with Misawa. If you want to watch those matches, good on you. They're an hour long. I didn't have Ritalin. And those are where all the crazy spots come in. Um, But I'll be honest. I I got a goddamn kid. I'm not watching a fucking hour-long match. You know what I mean? And I'm not a virgin. That's my fucking... (laughs) If I was alone and high, I'd be like, let's give it a spin, but... I mean, I'm about... I, You know, as soon as this podcast is over, I will be alone and high, but that's because I'm going to go take a nap. Yeah, and also, like, you know what, though? I will say this. The Japanese commentary I used to not like when I was a kid, and now I watch it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, because wrestling commentators never say anything good, so I don't need it. I do. I still need it. I want to hear someone just being like, what a maneuver! 
Oh, hey, do you know what that's called? That's called a uh, whoopsie doopsie. I'm Michael Cole. Yeah. Oh, well, he really gripped it. And of course, he also may have ripped it. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I guess I do want to have someone to remind me about KFC during a really good match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would just because uh, I like to think I'm like, I wonder who's the guy that gets paid to watch this every day. And then you just see a guy who still has a soul patch and you're like, yep. <laughs> I, knew, I knew one of the sad guy from a dueling pianos this is where i knew i'd find you yeah that kick was almost as strong as kfc's new zinger combo get him sean michaels also the match is over his career is done uh 1998 of course kobashi turned uh, a tag team with jun akiyama called burning which was actually also the tag team that val Venus and mr ass had <laughs> yeah Dylan. That's why the cat left. Yeah, because she she got she was like, which one of you gave me chlamydia? And then eight men put their hands up. None of them. <laughs> no, I was going like, to say, wait, what have you guys been doing? And they've been like, oh, we've been fucking your clothes, hoping to give you. chlamydia. Like, <laughs> why have you been doing that? And then Jerry Lawler came out of the shower and went hazing. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Ah, ha, ha, ha. And they all just chanted history's greatest monster. History's greatest monster. In learning about this, too, I came across... There's another podcast Post Wrestling did on Kobashi, and they had this where apparently Stephanie McMahon wanted to unmask Ultimo Dragon. Did you know this? No. Stephanie McMahon wanted to unmask Ultimo Dragon because she saw him with his mask off, and he, she was like, yeah, yeah, fucking nice. That's, just, that's so good that they were like, that Ultimo Dragon is just a fucking absolute okay how about this ultimo dragon mask. is a great name but how about this you unmask and now you're dr sploosh what do you think yeah how about unmask and now you're ultimo dildo for stephanie yeah and then it was like that was the that was the actual uh that was the middle ground no john no don't die that was the middle ground where it's like, okay, then I fuck my daughter. And he's like, and Stephanie was like, yeah, but then it's revealed that guy's my dad. And we only do the po- angle and porn where it's just his balls. And he's like, no, I like it. Okay. <laughs> Ultimo yeah. McMahon. I like it. Yeah. Ultimo McMahon. The name I wanted to give Shane. If, if <laughs> stolen that birth certificate from me. Ultimo warrior dragon. It is. How often do you think Vince held his kids? It's the, it's the over under is three. Three. Held what? Held them in his arms or underwater? Because those are two very different. <laughs> underwater. Survive, survive, day. survive. <laughs> every day he meets Shane by a lake and they wrestle for supremacy. I like that though. I the saw a TikTok where a guy just won't stop trying to fight his dad. <laughs> 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 that was good. I was like, maybe this is a good medium. I if mean, people are filming each other up. fighting their sons, that they can't be all been. So badly. Where oh. I was like, wait, what? If there's a part of the internet where it's just guys go with their sons, sign me up. Oh my god. It's all I've ever wanted from anything. <laughs> you just fucking... My name's Bill and his name's Bill because I named him my name. Let's get to fucking fighting. Um yeah. so pro wrestling the Noah. By, the dad, by the way, in all of those situations is either a guy who's had a beer, having a beer, or looking for a beer. Pro wrestling Noah, terrible name. Wonderful organization. Welcome to Pro Wrestling Noah. Why was it we formed? Were, it was formed because the giant Baba died. And, yes. Um, his wife Kobashi, took over. His wife took over. And so the. the and I've done no were, research. We're but just what happened? Johnny Ace just quietly <laughs> reading a book in the middle of the ring. <laughs> it was mostly Johnny Ace re- washing Ferraris. Johnny- that was the whole yeah, show. Why- <laughs> washing Ferraris and then reading from John Grisham's The Chamber in the middle of the ring. And Misawa was like, when do I wrestle? She's like, um, you get pinned by his dick. And then she went for a <laughs> high five and then he never high fived. Yeah, it was a giant uh, <laughs> uh, giant Baba's wife just kept trying to get Kenta to smell her fingers. Guess what it is? <laughs> what it is? That's his it's fucking stupid ass. ass. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that really made my. I gave him the old shocker, two in the stink yeah. and one in his cock hole to show him Baba's boss. Yeah, I am Baba. I am Baba. Take off your pantas. 
So, no, by this time, Johnny Ace is in, uh, I assume it's Johnny Ace was in WCW at this time, wasn't he? Because it's the year 2000. Yeah. So they would come along, Miss Baba, and she would be weeping. And they'd be like, I know you lost your husband. He's like, that's a stranger to me. Johnny's in WCW. And yeah, she'd be weeping. Johnny? No one is kissing my feet and also eating my pussy. Oh, ah! yeah. Just knowing you're at the top of the card because what, someone finds you hot. That must have been sick. Yeah, we, what's better than exactly, being respected as a wrestler? That's our entire lives. That's how we made it in uh, Yuck <laughs> yeah. Yucks. Is Mark Breslin saw both of us and just went, garing, garing. We got two Johnny Aces on our hands. Yeah, fucking call the club. I'm going to rename these bo- these, these boners Yuck and Yuck. <laughs> yum and yum. Um, So Kobashi has such a bad knee injury that he's actually out for 13 whole months. And probably the you most impressive thing is saying it is that yeah. someone who invented pro wrestling Noah was out for an injury. There are whole matches of pro wrestling Noah that actually have to take place inside an ICU unit. I pretty much. And they have that really cool green ring. Also, one of the things about Noah was that they pushed um, junior heavyweights a lot more than all Japan did. Do, junior heavyweights way more like a new Japan thing. Um, obviously, you got Muda. Um, also, towards the end of All Japan, we should mention that Vader comes over after the I'm just a fat piece of shit era yeah. and does yeah, the last era. great work of yeah. his career. Yeah, against I'm Kobashi. I'm a fat piece of shit. And he's like, how about this? I love hamburgers still in All Japan. And then that didn't yeah, work. Yeah, I'm just a fat piece of shit. <laughs> I'm just a fat piece of shit. But they go over to Noah and um, he has like the last great matches of his career against uh, Misawa, Akiyama. There's like a really good tag match I remember watching from when I was a kid where um, Jun Akiyama puts Kobashi oh. to sleep. Like he puts him in a guillotine and he loses the tag title because he basically looks and sees he's be- his partner being pinned but just realizes... I, f- I hate Kobashi this much. I'll actually sacrifice the tag titles, and then that kicks off a great feud. And 23 five-star matches, sprawling, um, sprawling fucking like 12 years. No, I think he had his first five-star match in 1990, so it's 15 years. Yeah, he's an unprecedented, amazing... Re- There's a reason why Dave Meltzer loves this guy is because he is a... Dave Meltzer, if you... Dave Meltzer is told one thing about each wrestler. And if that wrestler doesn't live up to that, then Dave Meltzer is eternally disappointed. And everyone and Dave Meltzer was told by someone like this guy's resilient and he'll be around for a while. And that's exactly what happened with Kento um, Kobashi. And so Dave Meltzer is just like, this is what I was told would happen. And I'm so pleased about it. Yeah. And at some point he comes up with the burning hammer, which is the coolest finishing move. Just a reverse Death Valley driver, but it's in Japan. So it's like, you're okay if I just drop you directly on your head and risk your life. And everyone's like, <laughs> yeah. Did he also come up with the GTS or that was someone else? No, that was Kenta full stop. And it was also like, this is more just Japanese booking style that was cool, but there's ways to lose to him. Where it's like now in the WWE, you have a million finishers. And, oh, this guy's only good because he lost to, like, the seventh attitude adjustment. But in Jap- in Japanese wrestling, it was like, oh, okay, he couldn't pit him with the Larry. He had to actually use the burning hammer. And then there's even variations of the burning hammer where it's like, he had to use that version of the burning hammer. This guy's good. So it's kind of like yeah. if you, you lost even though, or you won even though you lost. And it's just different layers. Very layered wrestling that they could totally do in WWE, but... They don't for some reason because they haven't accepted that there's four million wrestling fans and you just go up and down on who's going to watch. Yep, but they won't accept that because they're trying to be a capitalist organization. The idea is you need to be expanding, not understanding. Which makes sense. It's a content. It's a content thing, right? Like it's not about quality. It's just about getting shit out there, which I understand because we're both in the just say something to a microphone and put it out there business. Bottom line. All our teachers were wrong as kids. It is totally about quantity over quality now. It absolutely is, especially when it comes to uh, Kenta matches because they're all quality. So now you just want—they really are. I mean, you could just throw a fucking dart at a board just because it's a five-star match doesn't mean. And then you get like all these guys on different. The thing that's weird about wrestling is all five-star matches are literally determined by one guy who stole the metric system off another guy and that guy's friend. The friend, by the way, will not appear or acknowledge any of this in public. Who is it? Jim Cornette and a guy named Weasel Dooley. 
are who came <laughs> up with the Wrestler Observer <laughs> star rating system. Weasel Dooley. <laughs> they came up with it. And then Dave Meltzer heard about it, asked, can I use this in my in the Observer? And Jim Cornette said yes. It's crazy that Jim Cornette and Dave Meltzer, like, I guess it just shows you how age works, where it's like some guys just adjust and Dave Meltzer just like, you know, I mean, for all the things we make fun of him, he's looking great. He's got a family and Jim Cornette lives yeah, in a mountain of, of dildos and just screams, why isn't this like Tommy Rich into a microphone? Yeah. Tommy Rich should have fucking beat him. And it's also weird that guys like Cornette don't love um, this era of all Japan because it's exactly what they want out of wrestling. It's just they're not white people, so he's pissed to be reductive. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's amazing. once again... So Kenta goes to Noah. Noah then established Mm -hmm. itself as a third promotion. What I just want to go to is like this guy, literally, he grew up, saw Mike Tyson, wanted to be the Mike Tyson of wrestling and was so much more. He was he was a pioneer. He created his own company. He then is sort of like this eternal legend in Japan. He retires from Noah and kind of then just then just goes on to be a figure around Japanese wrestling. Oh, he also (laughs) beat cancer and then was like, I'll be back on this day and was. Yeah, he is still a wrestler, so there is some stuff he's going to do that's insane. Maybe just don't worry about coming back to the ring if you have cancer. Just maybe. Have <laughs> no, 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 no. He wrestled no. for I a mean, couple more years, and Japan has I this gave, really. I yeah. gave cancer the burning hammer. <laughs> I mean, and J- Japanese wrestling has this really great way of like, oh, you're starting to get injured. We'll just put you in tag matches at the top of the card because people want to see you, but you can't really wrestle anymore. And he does that till 2013 when he just gets out of wrestling. And now, of course, we don't know that much about um, Japanese pop culture. There may be shoot interviews about Japanese wrestlers where they're like, oh, Kenta Kobashi, you mean the guy who stole my car and sunk it just to say, ha ha, now you have less. He might be that kind of trash bag, but it seems like he's just a guy who got married after wrestling and had a kid. Yeah, it's basically like he he lived his entire dream and now it's like now to live my next dream raising a reasonable adult and then of course fielding prank call phone calls from stan hansen and terry funk <laughs> <laughs> i think it's crazy i guess to get to best and worst i mean i think it's crazy here's the best thing about kenta everything here's the worst thing that the wrestling industry only has one of this very nice man it's though i'd say the worst thing is that in the 90s wrestling wasn't like it is now because you just would have got like a long run of him and wcw being treated as an equal to like whoever the top star yeah. sting like him and sting Stain would have had like 90 minute matches. I also, I just want to know the story of him when he did his run, run of ring of honor, because he is, I sort of just assumed he was a lesser than, or it was a low point in his career, but he's a huge fucking deal in Japan. And then he comes over to ring of honor and he's wrestling at an Elks lodge. Like it's this like weird thing. Yeah. Where I'm like, I think he's just doing it for love of the game. No, he was doing it because they were like, okay, we're, we're going to start, Ring of Honor and Noah had this working relationship, and that started. But I mean, if you want to, if you want to be from Misawa and uh, Kobashi, I'm so sorry, everyone. That this is not the funniest episode. This is just a wrestling episode of the thing, but that's why it's Patreon, so it's for the fucking full cuck nerds. Mm. Here's the thing with it, though, as I understand. But why is Noah, who's the third, a third in this like artistically brilliant, like lauded critically organization, is working with Ring of Honor? Well, they took over. Noah totally took over. They took over all Japan, and then New Japan was in that, like, Inoki system where they were like, oh, everyone has to be an MMA? Oh, it turns out we all lost. Oh, yeah. that This was, like, the weird-ass time for Japanese wrestling where all Japan... Yeah, this is like, when they made Dr. Death fight a kickboxer, and Dr. Death got murdered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This you want to see something would... real sad. It's just like, your dad's friend who always brought steaks got knocked dead today. <laughs> yeah, because this is the time when, like, the Yakuza were like, we can't seem to infiltrate wrestling. Let's make pride. Pride is the biggest thing. Everyone's trying to be pride because Antonio Inoki is so yeah. weird. Antonio Inoki makes Vince McMahon look like the most humble man in the world. Do you understand that Antonio Inoki was like, I might lose my political seat. I better get North Korea to threaten 10 hundred, like uh, 200,000 people. Very good, yes. People. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so Very insane. good stuff. Well, you just want to keep going up and up and up. And there's people like Kobashi who are just like, yeah, it was, wrestling's fun. Now I'm uh, now I'm lying down. Yeah. But why did they do that? They did that because Noah and ROH had a great working agreement for a long time that, of course, went on the sidelines for various times and then got started up again by New Japan. If you want to be 
one of those people like as far as japanese wrestlers actually coming over to america and being like the main event and on the marquee kobashi kind of started that with samoa joe where it was like he came in everyone knew he was going to win and samoa joe was in tna at the time so it didn't really matter but it was really first dip in the pool of that i know and just how they did it was so fascinating i i'm and you're right, though. The Elks Lodge thing was jarring because I was always told, like, Kobashi's this really huge star. Yeah, and I know. Then, and that thing, and then you're like, but yeah. And, it's and then he's like in the ECW after. thing where it's like, well, Steve Carino could sell at that place. Like, yeah. But it's like, no. I've it's seen like, Easy it's, Money main event this place. And I mean, why yes, is this? But different? that was an exceptional match. And how dare you insult? Easy Money wasn't bad. I think, yeah, thank you. I've always, always been more of a kid cash man myself. How great must it have been for those old ECW guys? On the way out, they get to be ECW guys and just make a bit more money. Great. Yeah, they Kid Cash, I guarantee he was making a thousand bucks a weekend for like eight years because he like did a couple of moves off a ring rope and in- Oh buddy, and he was in TNA and he was great in TNA. The what TNA X division will go down as like the oh, yeah, opposite not the opposite, but like the same just as a waste. Just like the fact that like they had work rate like the nineties Japanese not obviously not as good, but like really good work rate. But the storyline was like, all right, you want his bike, but his bike is a girl and the girl is trying to suck you off and okay, she's your sister. Here's what it is. Here's the match. You guys are both at home asleep. You have dreams about each other. We see the dream. You met you wrestle. <laughs> yeah. It's the nightmare on Elm street match. Yeah. Um, how do you do that? Oh, I'm Vince Russo, bro. <laughs> I think if we put cameras up to your ears, we'll be able to see your dreams. <laughs> How about this? We both we shove you guys in a washing machine. That's the match. No cameras. We just hear yeah. the washing machine. How about this? You guys You've been shrunk by a shrink ball. ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just get very tired, and then I go to bed, and you guys tuck me in. <laughs> and that's the whole fucking match. How does that the sound, you little fucks? You tucking me in, you fuck. You fucking losers. All right, that's the end of this little show. And uh, we have many more. We just got a reflush with patrons, patron um, asking. By the way, everyone who does um, subscribe to Patreon, this really helps, and we really appreciate it. And I love you. Oh, we love you so much, uh, Larry Cantor Jr. Sorry, this episode was, um, and I don't know the man's real name, so Skinner X asked for this fucking episode. You fucking yo fuckers. Skinner. So Skinner, who is also known as Dan Spivey's kid, I assume. And Larry Cantor Jr., big old Larry, which one do you want to review, John, out of Tara Valkyrie, John Morrison, Kenny Omega, or Raven? I know nothing about Tara Valkyrie at all. Let's do it. I don't even know what organization she wrestled for. I think it was TNA. We're going to learn. We're going to do it. Tara Valkyrie's next time on the Patreon episode. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Sucky, sucky. Thank you, by the way. Can I just say thank you so much? This really uh, educated me on Japanese wrestling. I didn't know shit about this fucking dude. Yeah, it's very daunting because now it's like, oh, we should watch that. But it's like rewatching. Hey, you know what was good? The 1993-94 NBA seasons. So just watch all that. No. Yeah, why can't everything just be the documentary The Last Dance? Also, everything... I was trying to watch it. I was trying to find some storyline stuff on this. And it's like only real nerds who are talking to who are upset that you don't know about it yet oh yeah no no, no. You did. also japanese wrestling storylines are like and the match will be for whoever wins mm-hmm. the loser is a great bad idea you won but you have no honor so you've lost yeah all right dylan you know what this means it's my saturday and i have nothing to do for the rest of the day Ooh, so john's go. uh john's uh opiates that he stole off some teens are starting to kick in so we gotta uh, go i bought them off those teens i'll have you know i only it's sold stealing. the first time i describe any transaction with paper made up money as stealing oh, that's if right. you don't trade directly it's a steal dylan is john <laughs> john's one shoulder is going he's starting to jack off here all right, so John's going to finish, and uh, we're going to go bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening again. Suck me off. <laughs>